Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the One Sky Over All Community Speaker Series. This series is brought to you by Renison University College and the Waterloo Public Library. Renison University College, affiliated with the University of Waterloo, was established in 1959. Students of Renison earn University of Waterloo degrees. Our original founders established as the college's motto, the Latin phrase, sed cue lum solum, one sky over all. This phrase has evolved over the years to encompass all that we do. Renison believes deeply in contributing to a world where social justice, diversity and equity are not aspirations, but realities. Our programs reflect this view. We believe that barriers exist where ignorance and misunderstanding prevails. We aim to collapse these barriers through programs that improve our understanding of diverse languages and cultures, social and economic environments, and questions related to gender, spirituality, and a shared sense of belonging. Renison offers undergraduate degree programs in social development studies, honors arts, and honors arts and business. Our postgraduate programs include a Bachelor of Social Work and a Master of Social Work, which has a focus on health. Renison offers classes for undergraduate students who choose to minor in Applied Language Studies, East Asian Studies, or Studies in Islamic and Arab Cultures. We also have courses that count towards a major or a minor in religious studies. Renison also has a wide selection of community and professional education programs so you can experience culture, engage in language learning, or explore spirituality through a dynamic selection of events, workshops, courses, and programs at your own pace. Thank you for your interest in this series. Tonight's event is going to consider the stories of personal support workers who shared their experiences about working through the COVID pandemic. We used photo voice, which is an arts-based method as a way of encountering and engaging with these stories. Critical arts-based approaches to research have the capacity to consider the impact of a dominant discourse and to center personal experiences in a way that can amplify narratives that counter a dominant discourse. With critical arts-based research, lived experiences and narratives come forward that interrogate unjust power structures. In this way, social change is supported through counter narratives that are produced with creativity, with valued personal experience, and even with resistance to standard forms of research that are themselves premised upon dominant discourses. In this way, research itself can be taken up as another way to answer the call for social change. Photo voice is one arts-based approach that is significant in its community immersed capacity to center the voices of community members. Photo voice involves both storytelling and image creation as photographs are created by the storyteller to represent their story, a story that's been invited, shared and facilitated as part of the research process. Such a critical approach to photo voice research is participatory and relationship building in its engagement with community members throughout the process. Photo Voice also engages in an elicitation process that invites critical reflection in order to support consciousness raising. You're going to have the opportunity to see how this has occurred as we go on to describe our project and the stories that were shared with us by personal support workers. Thank you. I'm going to ask Veen now if she can talk a little bit about the, um, the project and the research itself, the design. Thank you, Trish. Hello, everyone. Um, so this project had actually um, started shortly after uh, the COVID pandemic um, and the lockdowns were uh, 
in place in back in early 2020. And uh, when Trisha and I had first initially started uh, coming up with the design for this research project, it was it stemmed from um, recognizing and realizing that we were hearing a lot of stories from the healthcare sector. But we realized that a lot of the stories that we were hearing and a lot of the voices that we were um, able to see in the media and in more public forums were from um, healthcare professionals such as nurses, doctors, and social workers. So when we were creating this research project, we wanted to focus on voices that um, we had not heard from. And this is where we landed on uh, on selecting personal support workers or PSWs as the main focus in terms of healthcare providers for this particular project. Now, um, this project originally, when we had designed it, we were um, hoping for a focus group of, of um, a couple of PSWs that we could get in to have a bit of a uh, discussion with each other to see if we could see if there were any common themes or common experiences between the uh, different PSWs. And these could be PSWs who worked within um, hospital settings, who worked within long-term care settings or within the community settings as well. Um, we found that quite early on um, after we had received uh, funding from the Social Science Research Council, um, a, they are an American funder, that um, we were unable to do and coordinate focus groups mainly because of the sheer amount of um, availability, lack of availability for the PSWs to convene in a group setting. So we had decided to shift gears and to do individual interviews with PSWs so that we could get a one-on-one -on -one, um, understanding of their particular experience. Uh, and so this was one of the couple of challenges that we had encountered in this particular project that um, because of the COVID circumstances had complicated um, our, uh, our study. Now the next phase after the participants, the PSWs, were able to tell us some of their experiences um, around, uh, around working during the pandemic, we had asked the PSWs to create photo voice images, to take images that were reflective of some of the experiences and stories that they had told us in this initial interview. After the participants had um, created some images, they would, uh, we would meet with the participants again and we also had a visual artist on, on our team as well too, who joined in in the second meeting. And during that particular meeting, we asked the PSWs to um, tell us a little bit about the images that they had taken and uh, what they were hoping to um, convey in their images, in their photo voice images. And the, the visual artist, uh, Jocelyn, was able to help them through Photoshop edit the images to the way that they, uh, the, the PSWs wanted to showcase to for the rest of the project. And you'll see a couple of examples later on in this presentation of some of the um, photo voice images that they created. In this second meeting, we also worked with the uh, PSWs to create a bit of an artist statement to go along with the images. So that's also something you will see in um, in our future presentation here. Um, and, and before we move on, uh, just just on the sort of the presentation um, of this project, I'm interested um, in Veen or, or Trish, you could jump in as well, um, just about the use of photo voice. So why photo voice and artist statements? Why use that as a means to present these stories? I can respond to that. Um, so photo voice 
It's a way of telling a story. So there's storytelling and there's also um, the, the invitation to tell a story. And so there's this story sharing that happens. And then to sort of explore the story even at a greater depth, then we invite people to think about, okay, so how would you image some of what you just shared? And so in that way, you end up getting into um, more layers of the story and what... Um, what we found, but also when we looked at a lot of other photo voice projects that have happened, we found that when stories were told and then this representation photograph could get um, created, there was a consciousness kind of raising that happened. It's almost like whatever my story is, I can see through telling and conveying in this way, I can see that there's a there's a structure, there's a context. And this isn't something about what's wrong with me. This is really about this world that I live in. And so that's what's really exciting about um, a research um, method like photo voice, because it does seem to get at that critical piece that um, mm -hmm. so much storytelling can evoke. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks so much, Trish. And, and Dean, just coming back to you, um, I know you mentioned initially that this was uh, started off with the hopes of being a focus group um, kind of set up, um, but that then changed to kind of gathering these individual stories. So how do you think that um, kind of shaped the outcome or kind of helped, you know, even help tell a better story now that you were able to kind of get that one on one uh, interaction with each of these personal support workers? It was definitely very interesting because now we, we were able to spend um, a, a whole hour, sometimes a little bit more if the PSWs had the time to share with us uh, and, and really get into some of the more nuanced experiences that they've had um, and, and to be able to explore into some of the circumstances um, that, that were magnified because of, of COVID, but may have actually existed prior to um, COVID, the COVID pandemic, and it, um, it, it was great in a way that we could do the individual one-on-one. -on -one. What we ended up doing after when we had um, enough participants and, and photo voice images was we actually created a bit of a presentation for, for the participants, um, and that was completely optional. We, we wanted to um, showcase a little bit of what everyone had, had done so far, because one of the big pieces about focus groups uh, um, is in sharing experiences and um, finding some commonalities, it can be very community building. It can feel um, less isolating. And, and that's what we found when we did the, um, when we kind of did a little presentation just for the participants was the feedback that we'd receive of, oh, I'm so glad that, you know, other people had shared in similar experiences. Like, I, I'm sad that they did, but I, I don't feel as alone. I, I feel a little bit, there's more solidarity there. Um, so there's definitely some pros and cons to uh, focus groups or to do it, doing it individually. And, and I, I feel like um, uh, Trish Tahir and I and, and the rest of the team had tried our best to try to um, manage a bit of that and, and to bring in as many of the benefits as we could from from these two different uh, styles, but it's uh, it, it's definitely was an interesting um, experience to be able to have and take the time uh, individually to really understand what each PSW was going through. Mm. For sure. And, and Veen, I know um, you also have a bit of a personal connection to um, kind of the conversation around um, PSWs and, and their experiences. So could you just uh, talk a bit about that? Yeah. So um, I know like my, my mom has also worked within um, the health sector as well, too, and was actively um, employed during the COVID pandemic, still is. There are... Um, and, and in talking with her about some of the ideas that we have with the project and hearing some of her experiences too, it's, um, it, it was quite interesting to see some of the similarities, even though she wasn't specifically employed as a PSW, uh, but she is a community mental health worker. And so a lot of these different um, 
themes and pieces that were coming in and struggles that were coming in because that, uh, that were magnified and amplified by the COVID pandemic was, um, was quite interesting to you to hear that it's not just one population or one um, sector within our health system. A lot of these pieces are, are, are um, at play for many other individuals as well too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was sort of a, a, a kind of shared experience um, that came out of the conversations that, that you've had over the last little bit. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and, and before we jump into um, the actual images and, and talking about the artist statements, um, Tahira, I, I wanted to um, kind of touch, you know, touching with you as well about uh, some of your connections and what you've seen um, personally, um, you know, knowing people who are in this field as well and what you've heard from them. Yeah. Um like me and my mom is also employed in the healthcare sector. She's actually working right now as a PSW. She's been doing so for her entire life since she immigrated to Canada. Um, a lot of the experiences that the PSWs had shared with us in their interview, it was really interesting to see how the stories my mom was telling me on our rides home were really similar to what the other PSWs had shared with us throughout their interviews. So a lot of them spoken about like different feelings of feeling like overworked or exploited. And it was interesting to see that it wasn't just in one institution and it wasn't just one setting. So my mom works in um, independent care facilities. So independent care homes where the older adults are more independent, they can take care of themselves. But it's interesting to see how PSWs working in the community and those working in long-term care homes or with veterans came back to tell the same stories as everyone else. So it was a really a shared experience that really highlighted some of the cracks that were happening and the, the gaps that were happening in their work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, wh why don't we get into some of those stories? So if you could just take us through, um, you know, the, the photo voices that you selected, and I know you have some um, slides as well to show us. Yes. Um, Nancy, if you could please show um, the first photo voice, A, oh, number one, sorry. So this photo voice is titled, Did You Have Us In Mind? PSW Voice It Out. Is this worth the training I have a student loan for? Who and what do you pay if this is what you bring home every two weeks? Now, the same training is being given for free that I took a student loan for, and nobody had me in mind when they decided to give this training for free. How do I even pay rent with this? Nobody thinks of us before implementing changes. So this photo voice was speaking to this PSW's experience of being in this field and being so overlooked. They felt invisible in their work. So um, it's very hard to see the numbers here, but this PSW was bringing home about $300 after taxes every single, bi-weekly. So every month about 600. And at the top, that's a student loan that she owed. So with that money, she had to pay for groceries for her family. She had about two children. She had to pay for transportation to and from work. She had bills that needed to be paid, rent. And then she still had to provide for her family as well. So it's just speaking about being overlooked when the government was making choices and making decisions about who would be getting this program for free. They're speaking about how they'd forgotten the pr previous or prior PSWs that had been working throughout the entire pandemic and really trying to focus the funding and the training on new PSWs that are coming into the field rather than taking care of those that had been there. And if we could see number two, please. And this was a really strong um, photo voice as well. I, Veen referenced that um, a lot of the issues that PSWs were having were pre-existing. Um, the PSW is sure that none of these issues had been new, but they'd just been magnified by the COVID pandemic. So this one is magnify the volume. And this PSW wrote, this image describes what it is like to be a PSW, calling out for better protection, better working conditions, and better regulation. The work we do is so important. It requires great skill, hard work, and a lot of knowledge about health and well-being. During COVID-19, we've had to work even harder, and all of the concerns we have as health workers get even more magnified. So in this photo, she speaks about the lack of benefits that they receive. Um, that full-time positions are hard to come by, that living wage is really hard for PSWs as well, that there's no standardization of training, and that there's no regulatory body for PSWs. 
I'll stop on this one a little bit more to kind of give it a little bit more detail and a little bit more context. Um, in speaking to the PSWs that we interviewed throughout the project, um, a few of them had worked full time and had benefits and were secure in their positions, but many of them felt that their positions were very um, insecure. They were working part time hours at several different long term care homes to kind of make a full time schedule. And those long term care homes were not paying them a living wage. So they'd have to commute from one long term care home in the morning to another one in the evening and another one maybe during lunchtime just to make that full 35 or 40 hours for the week to be able to take care of their families. And um, with the standardization of training, they were really having a tough time because a lot of the PSWs that had been coming into the homes were not trained like, in the same way that the others were. So they're just thrown into these settings and expected to work and just, just learn on the go. So it was really difficult for those of them that had been there for such a long time to have to also shoulder the responsibility of training other PSWs when they first came into the work as well and having like different expectations at every care home that they worked at. And that also spoke to the lack of regulatory body. So there's no one overlooking these PSWs. There's no one looking to see and make sure that they're being paid a living wage. There's no one looking out for their best interest. There's no one advocating for them. So this one was more of a call to action and really just voicing out what they were really struggling with at the time and have been struggling with throughout. And if we could pull up number three. And oh, number three, so this PSW was sharing her experience of being not only a PSW and a woman working in the field, but also being a black woman working as a PSW. So her experience, she wanted to share a photo of herself that really spoke to how she felt. She wanted to highlight like the difference that her race made in her work. So we titled her image layers and her statement was, there are many layers of insecurity financial, physical, psychological, and emotional. This PSW feels uncertain because of the strong hierarchies that affect their work, experience, especially as a person of color. This PSW feels awful not being able to do so much of the close caring that they want to be doing now. So we found that a lot of the PSWs spoke about hierarchies in their work. So not only hierarchies um, with a doctor on top that delegates work to the nurses and the nurses that delegate work to PSWs, but also within PSWs themselves. So different racial groups would um, have a different working experience than other racial groups. Um, the women working there would have a different experience than other women or immigrants would have a harder time working than people that non-immigrants. So it was a very interesting dynamic to see really how their social location really changed based on like where they worked and their background coming into the work that they were doing and how that really affected how they were treated in their work. And if we can go to, I believe it was quote A. So this statement was from one of the PSWs directly during our interview. It's something that was transcribed that we felt was really important for us to pull out and share with everybody. So this PSW shared, when I go to work, COVID is a risk that I have to take. I pray not to be in the wrong place at the wrong time because it will not be easy. I need to be healthy in order to work. We are the ones doing the job and we are not being recognized for the job that we are doing. I love what I do and I want to help. If it was just about the money, I would not do this. So again, this PSW spoke about not feeling being, they're being recognized for their work. So decisions being made about their work and rules being implemented without cons consultation from the PSWs. I think one of the quotes that came out quite often as you spoke to the PSWs were nothing about, nothing about us without us because PSWs had not been given the opportunity to speak about any of the new regulations that were happening during COVID. So when they were told they could only work in one long-term care home, that had such a huge impact on so many of the PSWs. For some, it halved their income because they were not able to go between the same long-term care homes they were before. The long-term care homes were not obligated to give them a certain amount of hours. So you can go from working 35, 40 hours a week to working on call at one home whenever they needed you. 
You could go to working three hours with one client if that client only needed care for three hours during that week. So there is no security for them in their work and there was no one really looking out for them. So it was such a tough time for them to navigate. And I believe we have number four left for this. And this was the last one. It's, um, will we be recognized? The spotlight is on us now, but what happens when the pandemic is over? Will our work still be recognized? Will we still be as important as we were all, as we were all this pandemic? Join us in shining and owning up to recognize the amazing things we do as PSWs, the lives we save, the lives we make better. It is a chance to show the world what we deserve. So again, this PSW is speaking about the lack of recognition in their work. Right now, PSWs are important because the government and our society sees them as being important during the pandemic. But after the pandemic is over and after we are not having any more outbreaks, what happens to the PSWs when their um, wage increase is taken away, when that's over? What happens when they're no longer like the, the center of attention? Will we see them once again kind of fall to the bottom of their hierarchy and continue to experience the low wages, the lack of benefits, the lack of regulation? Will there be any improvement in their work? coming from this pandemic, coming out of our recognition of how important they have been. I'll pause here <laughs> because we've gone through quite a few. Well, thank you so much, Tahira. It's, it's really, of course, you know, fascinating just to hear kind of the, um, the scope of, of where this story goes and, of course, the experiences um, of different PSWs as you go from institution to institution. Um, and I just, you know, of course, as, as someone who's uh, a part of this project, I'm just wondering um, what were some of the larger, you know, if you had to boil it down to a few kind of themes that came up or that recurred throughout these conversations um, that you heard from these PSWs, what would a few of those be? Um, a few of the things that were really notable that we spoke about quite often were the hierarchies that they experienced in their work um, and power structures and um, just how that really affected communication with PSWs, what they were told and what they weren't told. Hmm. And again, about precarious employment and lack of safety and lack of access to safe working conditions. Those are really, really strong themes that came out. And one of the um, biggest themes that we found that really spoke in all of our interviews was that the PSWs had a really like, strong ethic of care. Like they got into this field because they cared so much about their clients. They do this work because they care so much about their clients. As the last quote said, they wouldn't have been here if it was for the pay, but instead they're here because they care so much about the work that they do and the people that they care for that they're willing to overlook and willing to kind of sacrifice themselves to take care of the ones that they want to support. Mm -hmm. And and just, you know, of course, um, and Veen, you can jump in as well as somebody who as, you know, a people who kind of know or have relationships with people in this field, um, is that something as well that's echoed in your personal experience, kind of that, that idea of just wanting to be in that space and to help and to fulfill that um, kind of duty of care as opposed to being in it for the money? Absolutely. I think there's... Um almost a, a little ongoing joke with a lot of um, staff members and, and employees who, who work within the healthcare or social service sector and they go, you know, I'm not in it for the money. <laughs> if I was, I would go to, you know, an, a different sector. And it's, it, it's very much because I think a lot of the um, individuals and, and particularly with the PSWs that we had interviewed over and over again, they, they, there was a repetitive theme. Everyone, single one of them had talked about their, how their work, how their care has been affected. Um, and, and the way that they were used to providing care and the level of care that they were able to provide has, has now been diminished or, or has even in some cases been completely eliminated. And that being such a struggle and such a loss for them individually and professionally. So definitely this is something that was a, a very, um, common thread and theme to, across all of the interviews and even in uh, personal anecdotes outside of the interviews from, from those who work within um, the health and, and social service sectors. Mm -hmm. and, and just in terms of the, the kind of changes to the nature of care that these PSWs are able to provide, is that a function of just 
COVID and that kind of lack of uh, personal contact, like that kind of thing? Or is that also tied to some of the more larger systemic issues like the, you know, cutting of hours or, you know, a lack of a living wage, like our, or, or is it both? It's, it, I believe it's actually both. Um, again, I think a lot of these concerns and a lot of these issues were already pre-existing prior to COVID. They are becoming more magnified um, in during the pandemic times and, and things like um, not being, you know, having to wear the uh, PPEs um, or having to distance um, certain ways or, or other precautions um, because of COVID that might be fairly unique to the COVID pandemic, but more systemic pieces like um, the lack of stability for uh, for permanent positions or, or being able to have um, living wages. Um, a couple of the interviews that we had done talked spoke about um, the lack of a uh, college. Um, you know, unlike doctors, nurses, social workers, there are regulatory colleges, PSWs don't have that. Um, and so and so there's a lot of different pieces systemically, there's a lot of different pieces that are at play now. But again, a lot of these issues had already been existing prior to COVID. It's just COVID's made it a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And Tahira, just coming back to you, um, I'm just wondering what were some of the kind of I guess, material changes um, that you heard that this, these PSWs would like to see in terms of just the nature of their work and, and the ways that they are being um, kind of you, you treated by these institutions. What were some of the things that came up there? I think one of the biggest things would be a voice. Um, just to sit at the table to be able to speak on some of these issues. I think a lot of these are larger issues that takes quite a while to address, of course, but just being able to contribute to the conversation and be a part of it rather than having someone tell you that this is what's being done on your behalf without your consultation. So the regulatory body was really important to a lot of PSWs, but so was their relationship with one another and being able to come together. So the regulatory body, of course, is, is an important factor, but also that union between PSWs, that partnership and that allyship between PSWs and outside of that as well. So who else is looking out for their best interests? and finding ways to partner them with the PSWs and different PSW groups so that they could work together amongst themselves to really organize. Mm -hmm. and, and just before I go, oh, sorry, Trish, please go ahead. Well, I just, um, <clears throat> I wanted to pick up on that partnership piece that Tahira mm -hmm. was talking about and also some of the things that Veen was saying, because it what, what really became so apparent was how layered all of this is and so it also tells a global story right like labor relations between countries and so for example when you think about um you know the the capacity to care being diminished by the pandemic well that's layered in with you know and um you know if you think about the training that's available in the philippines for health work and the um the accomplishments, the training, the training that um, many um, people receive, and then when um, when they come to Canada to actually work in the health system, it's an incredibly diminished role. Um, you know, from nurse, you know, um, you know, a registered nursing training, and then to Canada that it's the PSW position. Um, that's available and that further training is required. So you start to see even how all of this is, is keeps looping back in on itself. Mm -hmm. And so the partnerships then also become much broader. Like this isn't just about what is happening for PSW, PSWs, this is what's happening for women in the labor force. This is what's happening for migrant workers. This is what's happening for people of color. And so we just started to see like the just a uh, complexity um, that, that, yeah, that affects even when we talk about partnerships, what those partnerships need to end up looking like. 
Mm -hmm. and, and just picking up on that as well, um, I know Tahira, you did mention that race was a question um, that came up for, for a couple of folks. So could you just expand on, you know, what, um, I guess, what that situation is and how that plays a role in um, their, the, the experiences of racialized PSWs as they navigate this um, COVID pandemic and, and all that it's brought? Yeah, um, as Trish shared, it's been very layered. Um, the experience is very layered for different PSWs. So we found that a lot of the PSWs we had spoken to had been immigrants and had been women and racialized individuals as well. So when you're adding all those factors in to one another, it really speaks to how are they, how are they viewed and how are they valued? How do we value their labor? And as Trish shared, they're coming into, a lot of them are coming into Canada with much higher education and they're having their education kind of ignored. Um, a lot of them are, have been trained as RNs and registered nurses. I think one of them had shared that she had owned a business back home and she came here and this is what she was able to do for work is support her family. So we're taking everyone that is coming in and they're already kind of vulnerable. They are, they are migrant workers. They don't have very many options when they first come in. And we're taking these people and putting them in these positions because we can, because we don't have to ensure that they have adequate hours because they don't have that voice to speak for themselves really yet. So it's, it's the, a lot of people have share that they felt taken advantage of and felt exploited by their employers because they didn't have anyone else to turn to, to say like, this is what's happening and no one else would advocate on their behalf. So it, it is very complex. And I sure said the partnerships do have to look very, very different because the PSWs are all very different, though they share similar stories. Mm -hmm. And are there, uh, this is kind of a, a larger question for anyone can jump in, but are there any kind of networks, um, kind of like the ones that you created just through this research by which PSWs are getting together to kind of either talk about these issues or find ways to advocate around them? Like, is there any, is there anything like that that you heard about through the research? There are, um, there are PSW networks and Facebook groups um, and that type of thing. What we heard PSWs asking for and identifying as not existing are um, kind of advocacy or even union um, types of organizations. And so those were the requests that were being made. I do believe that the PSW groups are doing advocacy work. Um, and maybe that's where we ask questions about, you know, how much, like, how can we expand these partnerships um, to create something even more cohesive and powerful? Yeah. And just before I move on, um, I did want to just remind um, our viewers that we do have a Q&A portion. So please feel free to drop any questions you might have in there and we'll be sure to address them um, at the end of the discussion. Um, so yeah, Trish, um, I know that part of this research was also, uh, the hope was to use some of these findings uh, to support change and future change um, for PSWs. So have you kind of started looking into what, you know, some of those um, uh, initiatives might be? Yeah, yeah. One of the, um, one of the other um, research team members actually is, um, a woman who lives in BC and she is very involved in the um, Filipino, Filipina community in BC. And so she connected us to Migrante BC, which is a really wonderful advocacy group. And so they've, they've been so generous um, in terms of just kind of embracing our project and also providing really important training to us. And so what, what we're doing now is we're exchanging knowledge, we're exchanging um, uh, what we've learned, but also um, our images and the statements so that, that our work can become part of their advocacy efforts. Um, and we have been connecting with um, Tahira, maybe you want to speak to this. You've been reaching out and making some really nice connections, even with um, politicians who have taken up, you know, um, workers as um, as an advocacy sort of focus. Yeah. Yes, we've. Um, it's really important for us that we're not only collecting these stories, but we're also sharing them in ways that are that are honoring the stories that the PSWs have shared with us. So when we get their stories, we keep them. 
and we're, we've been sharing them on our Instagram um, with a larger population. And we've also been going and sharing them with different MPPs in hopes that they will support the research enough to share it with their, with their networks as well. So right now we've been working with different MPPs. We are looking forward to sharing the research on a larger platform through a book club that we'll be participating in throughout the month of August. And we're hoping to uh, get some more eyes and ears on the stories that the PSWs have been sharing with us. Mm -hmm. And so far, um, you know, what's kind of been the, the response, I guess, from the, um, I guess, the powers that be that kind of do have the capacity to create change for these PSWs? Like, what are, has there been any response from politicians or anything like that? Um, we've spoken to politicians who, who have talked about being very concerned about this issue and that it's part of their platform. We also are now um, speaking to a, an MPP who is wanting to activate um, community members. And so thinking about um, bringing petitions together, two areas of focus um, that have come forward as a suggestion is um, to make a, a request with as many signatures as possible that the um, tuition, the tuition loans get forgiven for any PSW who has worked through the pandemic. So not only providing this free tuition, you know, free of tuition training to incoming PSWs, but also forgiving the loans of those who have worked through the pandemic. So that's just one idea. Um, uh, and so there, there is, it's exciting to hear about these ideas um, for action um, that are coming forward at that level and about getting community members involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I'd love to just go around before we kind of wrap up and move to the Q&A um, and just get a sense from each of you. Um, I know you you talked a bit, uh, Trish, about the fact that this is a very layered conversation and it's also, you know, it becomes a larger conversation about labor um, and about, you know, the infrastructures of care in our society, essentially. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, what's been the biggest lesson for each of you kind of as you've done this research and you've heard these conversations um, just in terms of what we what, you know, the role of, um, you know, PSWs in our society in terms of kind of, you know, making up that infrastructure of care and what, what can be done better to help them. So anyone can jump in? <laughs> I, I can start. I think for me, um, you know, it's something that I have known kind of at this theoretical in my head level, but to, to really learn about this lived experience, the day-to-day -day life and, and, it's, and how very um, big those micro stories are, how very macro those micro stories are. And so to hear about, you know, the, um, the care worker who um, sends money every month back to her family to, to provide support to them. And then when her hours got cut by a third or by two thirds actually, so she was working a third of what she normally did, she, hadn't, she didn't have the capacity to send as much support back home, which then put her families into a very financially precarious position. And when they went to get support from their government, they were denied because they have an overseas worker in their family. And so just to see what is it called, the butterfly effect? I can't remember, but just to see how these global events, they completely impact, you know, this, the the day-to-day -day experience in such a significant way. And, and to see, you know, that, that race is such a huge part of um, that experience. And so race is lived locally and globally. Um, in such a significant way. So that was for me, just getting, a, you know, that, that really moved it out of my head so that I really could feel that story. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, Veen, did you want to jump in next? Yeah, I, I think for me, the stories that um, personally resonated um, a lot with me were, were the PSWs who were immigrants. Um, so 
a little bit of a context, my family and I were all immigrated here into Canada and seeing the struggles and knowing the struggles that um, I've experienced with my family as, as first generation immigrants um, and, and then hearing the PSW stories of um, having these different layers and these different pieces. And again, we've talked about it briefly a little bit about um, individuals being tra highly trained internationally, uh, whether their education or their experiences are not being recognized and having to start from basically scratch or finding work that can provide them with income right now because that's what the family needs at this moment. Um, and so, you know, Trisha, there, there are these larger macro, um, national, international layers as well too, that all affect how individuals and families are actually able to get by on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's, it seems disconnected, but it's all connected. And these are pieces that we're hoping at least with project, um, like, like our research study to be able to address and to be able to um, communicate with the general public and, and to get community members involved and interested in to, uh, to start um, activating some of these movement and uh, calls for action and, and the need for change. Mm, absolutely. And, and Tahira? I think what stood out to me the most going through this project and speaking with so many PSWs was really just how caring they were, just how much they cared about what they did. Um, throughout the, every interview we did, everyone spoke about their clients, but they also spoke about feeling tired and burnt out. And like their job had lost meaning during this time. And it wasn't because like they were overworked or there were too many hours or there's too much to do. It was because their work had changed so much in such a short time that it lost meaning for them. I think in one of the interviews that we did, what really stood out for me was this PSW was sharing that um, the second wave had happened and her mother had called her and asked her to, to stop working during this time for fear of her safety. And she said, what if it was dad? What if it was my dad? Would you want me to leave him? And that spoke so much to how much these PSWs cared to put themselves on the front line. And during a time when no one knew how the um, virus was being transmitted, whether they needed shields or masks and working without the proper PPE and still going in every single day to care for their clients. Just the ethic of care and how compassionate they've been during this time and how compassionate they continue to be even now as they speak about the, the exploitation of their work, the precarity of their work, no matter what they bring up, they always bring it back to, but I love my clients. And sometimes my mom will come home after a difficult day of work and I'll ask her, I'm like, you could just take tomorrow off, but she's like, who's going to take care of my client in the morning at nine o'clock? And that's what's the most important to them. Not their tiredness, not their exhaustion, not their feelings, but their clients receiving the care that they need and deserve. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for those fantastic responses. I mean, I've learned so much personally um, from this discussion, and, and I hope that, you know, the, these conversations kind of continue to happen. Um, and we really appreciate, of course, you sharing the details of this research with us. Um, so thank you so much, Veen, Tahira, um, and Trish. Um, and so before we finish, of course, we're going to go, we do have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to take those one by one. Um, and maybe we can just, you know, anyone can kind of jump in to, to answer the Q&A questions. Um, so the first one, uh, the first question is, what's the Instagram handle where we can see the story? So is there an Instagram handle or any kind of social media or a website where uh, these stories can be viewed? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Instagram handle is at PSW underscore voices. Um, and we're more than happy to um, send out the, uh, the link to that as well, too. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Veen. And I think Tahira just also um, posted um, the just the wording of the Instagram handle. Um, and so uh, the next question, thank you, everyone for sharing your research. How do regulatory bodies get formed? What would be the next steps for PSWs to make sure that one gets put in place? My sense is that it's, it's all about advocacy and it's about organizing. And, um, and this is where I believe that wide partnership, 
I think that, that those kind of demands, they can be heard from different places. Um, and so within um, the PSW um, world, but also with many uh, uh, connected worlds um, where people are concerned about what is happening to care labor. So advocacy and organized um, advocacy across a number of different sectors. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and of course, keeping conversations like this uh, kind of going. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, so the next question is, um, did you celebrate on behalf of the PSWs the July 5th announcement by Ontario Premier Doug Ford, the promise to increase the PSW pay by $3 an hour? What I find really interesting is that um, we didn't hear a whole lot about that from PSWs. Hmm. And so I, I'm really curious about how, um, how that promise is being taken up by PSWs. And I don't know, Tahira or Veen, what you have been hearing about how are health workers feeling about this promise? We haven't heard it in our interviews. I, I think, um, as some of you may, may know, earlier in, in the pandemic, um, the Ontario government had um, announced that they were going to do a pandemic pay increase for um, frontline workers um, in the pandemic. And what we found, at least with uh, when this was brought up in, in our interviews, was that for many of the PSWs, they actually didn't receive that um, increase in, in income for several months. Um, and so I think this might also, uh, there, there might be, I'm just assuming some apprehension. There, there's a lot of announcements that, that can happen, whether it promises um, immediate um, action for PSWs who, who are working, um, and, and, and fighting this uh, COVID pandemic is, I think, another question. Um, but yes, I know when it was, when there was a previous um, pay increase announced, um, it had taken, um, I believe it was most of the PSWs that we had interviewed several months before they, they, they were even able to receive um, some of that money. Um, to add on to Veen's point as well, the PSWs that did share that they did receive the money only received so from the date that they asked. They never received it retroactively from the time of the announcement. So quite a few of them shared that they had received only from the day they asked. If they had asked on July 14th, they only got it from there onwards and not anything they were owed from previous months. Okay, so there's, it sounds like there's definitely a question of the way that this is being rolled out. Um, but just in terms of even that dollar figure, like the increase of $3 an hour in your mind and based on many conversations that you've had, like, is that enough? Like have these measures that have been announced so far, are they kind of sufficient in kind of taking a step forward with this issue? Or is there more that needs to be done around even just that dollar amount? Mm -hmm. I can speak to that a little bit. I think the dollar amount is important because it does recognize the work that they've been doing, but that dollar amount doesn't come with an assurance of hours, a guaranteed number of hours at any care home setting. It doesn't come with like standardized training for all PSWs across the board. It doesn't come for any regulation for what their terms of employment are. It doesn't come with more full-time permanent positions for them either. So the dollar amount is great. And I'm sure many of them will be very happy to hear or have been happy to hear that this has been done but there's still more that needs to be addressed to make sure that all PSWs are on level playing field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The okay. structural change. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the bigger structural changes for sure. Um, okay, so the next question is, uh, were you able to connect with some clients um, and learn about how their, their lives were touched or impacted by the care provided by PSWs? So these would be clients of the PSWs. Did you hear anything from them at all? I wonder, um, Tahira, I think you had set aside a few images of, um, that, that really speak to the kind of care that happens. I wonder, this might be, to answer that question, I wonder if we could show some of those images. Um, just, I find them quite impactful. Yeah. yeah. Um, Nancy, if we could please, um, Nancy, number seven. Yeah. yeah, and slide number seven would be perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one was titled Loving Touch. I'll just read it very quickly. 
I love her hands. They are hands of wisdom, age, so much life. They are beautiful. They are also in pain and I cannot touch and comfort how I used to. The people I care for don't understand these rules. They reach out for care and you have to take a step back. You see the hurt look in their face. I came to the field to care for others and you can't. Um, I think the important part of this story was that um, this PSW had taken a picture of her client and uh, her client's family member who was unable to even have physical contact with her because she had on the gown and her gloves and a shield and a mask and she was fully covered in PPE from head to toe. So even the care that they were receiving and the comfort that they were receiving during these times had changed so much for the PSWs. And in this experience, I believe that this woman had passed away shortly after, this client had passed away shortly after, and this photo voice that she had created with the assistance of Jocelyn who edited it for her, it was so touching to her that she went back and shared it with the family because it's something that they wanted to keep as a memory of their family member. So it not only was helpful for the project, but the PSWs themselves were really, really proud of what they created and went back and shared it with their clients. And this also raises a kind of a question for me. Um, I'm wondering, is there, and, and did this come up in any of your interviews, kind of an emotional or, or, or kind of a psychological impact to the way that the nature of care has changed over the last year, either on the side of the clients or the PSWs? Yeah, um, if we could pull up slide number five, I think that one speaks to it really well. I think this is a perfect time to have the PSW speak, so I don't want to be the one to speak for them. So number five was paperwork or person, and just quickly read through. Too often clients are seen and treated as numbers on pieces of paper. Organizations strip a client's humanity when funding is prioritized over care. PSWs, like myself, support the fundamental human need of human connection by providing care and support. This image of my client's bed littered with papers symbolizes the dehumanization of a human being when care is not prioritized. This PSW had shared that one of her longstanding clients that she'd been working with for several years had passed away. And that's the paperwork on the bed that she had to fill out after her client had passed. So during that time, she was grieving the loss of her client, but was also expected to do more work on top of that to really go through all this paperwork. So it was, it spoke more to the exhaustion that they felt, the grief that they were feeling, the loss of some of their clients. So th there was a really strong emotional reaction from the PSWs for losing the way that they had provided care in the past. And even though we didn't actually speak with any people who were receiving the care of PSWs as part of this research project, these stories, like the one that um, Tahir just shared, they really speak to that powerful connection. We spoke with one PSW who um, he had been working privately with um, a woman who eventually had to be brought to an institution and the family asked um, if he could continue to work with her. So then the organization um, uh, allowed him to come in and they liked his work so much that they ended up hiring him. So when he was in the organize, when he was first supporting this woman, the family was paying for it, but then the, the organization began to hire him for more hours. And he joined the choir that was in this, um, this organization. And, and so you hear these stories about people loving their work and also the, the, the depth of connection and relationship that gets built with the people that they're um, offering care to. Absolutely, yeah. And that's, I guess it speaks to, again, kind of that, um, that broader kind of commonality among them all of this is like our heart is in this work, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so just, um, I think one last question, it's a bit of a longer one, so I'll, I'll just go through it quickly. Um, so it says, thank you all for sharing these very important PSW voices. As somebody who, as someone who worked alongside PSWs for years in the home care sector, they do amazing work and their voices have been minimized for far too long. The, they are the backbone of the home care sector, which would collapse if not for them. 
I also agree that they need some form of, of an organized body to advocate for their benefits, full-time hours, job security, et cetera. The problem is that private for-profit companies receive Ministry of Health funding to provide services where there is little to no oversight over how this money is dispersed, i.e. senior management, et cetera i.e. the Sunshine List highlights publicly funded agencies and their salaries, however, does not identify those companies who receive government funding and contract who use this money to pay large salaries to top execs but leave PSWs and other contracted uh, direct care providers without a living wage, benefits, pensions, and some sense of security. So yeah, I'm kind of more of a comment, but does that ring true to you from what you've, uh, from your research? Well, even what Tahira talked about where there was um, pandemic pay that did not get paid until someone came forward and asked, and then it wasn't retroactively paid, but the government was paying out that money. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so this, the way in which funds get absorbed that's described here in this comment, it sounds really familiar to me in terms of the pandemic pay piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this also kind of uh, brings up the question of just, you know, again, the value, as we talked about, of these workers and the value that we place on them as workers and on the work that they do. So, you know, is there a sense that kind of, you know, as you go higher up the chain, there's less of a value placed on these hugely important individuals and the work that they're doing? Could that be part of it? Yeah, there's that hierarchy piece that um, really came in there. And um, it's really interesting because um, this comment talks about oversight and, you know, the, the idea about um, having a regulatory body that it could provide that kind of protection. What we did hear about was other forms of surveillance that were not protecting PSWs, but in fact, were almost criminalizing PSWs. So cameras set up to catch PSWs who were not doing it as they should have and, and set up in places that were mostly places where PSWs and their um, the, the people that they were supporting. So places that PSWs spent more time in than nurses, for example. So there was like this hierarchy of surveillance. And so this the, the regulatory body, it would be also offering an oversight, but in the name of protection rather than criminalization or penalty. So it's that was kind of an interesting piece as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting to see that the, the kind of resources are there to kind of uh, monitor or give oversight over the PSWs in one direction, but not in the other, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's it for um, all of the questions that came through the Q&A. Um, and I wanted to say thank you so much again um, to Trish, Tahira, and Dean. Um, before we leave, though, I wanted to leave the floor open. If uh, e uh, any of you had any kind of final comments that you wanted to um, leave us with, or even just, uh, again, reiterating where we can find um, the project. Yeah. I think, um, so I believe Tahira posted in our chat the um, handle for Instagram and as well as the link to the Instagram project as well too. So um, I invite everyone here to take a look at the account. There are a lot more of the images on there as well too. And um, please feel free to share the account as widely as you can. Uh, we are also, um, actually uh, starting to recruit again um, to hear more voices from PSWs. So if you know anyone who might be interested in participating and sharing some of their experiences and stories, we're definitely very interested in hearing um, from them as well. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much again for, you know, of course, doing this research, but also making the time to share it with us. These are hugely important conversations, and um, I hope that we can kind of find more ways to get to get those stories out there and to get those voices uh, heard, as you say. So thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Nancy, I think. We'll come back up before we leave. Hi, everyone. Uh, oh. Just want to make sure that my um, 
that my mic was on. Um, hi, everyone. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and joining us for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Teo, for uh, moderating and um, Dr. Van Wick and Tahira and Veen uh, for sharing all of your research with us. Um, it looks like really interesting work, but also important work. And uh, thank you to Renison University College for this partnership um, and bringing this lecture to you and uh, to all of us. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Everyone take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.